So we're going to be talking about, last time we spoke about C-sets, these key categorical data structures for encoding information. A C-set at a technical level is a functor, structure preserving transformation, from a schema category, C, to set, right? Um, and uh, last time, we had seen that uh, we had a two schema, um, two schema categories that we had examined. One of them was this category GR, um, uh, which despite its fearsome sounding name, um, is a free category on a rather simple structure. We have arrows and vertices, and we have a source morphism from arrow to vertex and a target morphism to arrow and vertex. Um, but by itself, that didn't have, that didn't describe a particular graph, right? This describes graphhood, graphness, um, right? And in order to have it describe a particular graph, what do we do? We do what with it? We map it into sets, right? Um, or sometimes we wave our hands and, and, and it's into fin set or skeleton of fin set where we have each set is, the, you know, of, of a given size is unique sometimes. We collapse things of all the same size to be the same one. Um, and uh, so what we have to encode a particular graph is a, is a functor or structure preserving mapping from this into set. Um, and we did that for this schema and we encoded some graphs left time. Do you remember that? Um, and we also did it for the schema DDS, which um, I don't have, uh, is it in the next section? That's what I, I thought, here it is, this DDS, yeah. Uh, which is not um, uh, uh, referring to a dentist, but to a um, discrete dynamical system, right? Um, where we have state and X. And again, this, this describes dynamical systemness, um, but it's really by mapping it into set that we have a set of states and a function that maps from that, from each, um, from that set of states to the, to, to the set of states reflecting for each state, what's its next state. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And you encoded these diagrams like that last time. Remember that? Mm -hmm. um, so we saw that we could use these as kind of a categorical data structure to encode information. And these had this great generality. And because it was functorial, we saw, for example, just having a, a functor which defines, you know, the set of states and defines next, uh, the next relation. Um, it Because it's functorial, comp maps the functor applied to a composition in this category, say next applied after next, is given by the composition in set. So the function to which next maps uh, applied composed with the function to which next map. In other words, iterating the next function for your particular graph twice, right? And the same thing all three times and four times. And it's associative by the definition of a category. It's associative um, as well. Uh, so that gave us a lot of versatility in being able to, to work with these. And we noted that if there's no equations, they're free categories. This is a presentation of a free category. And so it, even though it only shows next, it doesn't show the identity um, morphism, we know that not only is there an identity morphism for all objects, we know that that this generates. Um, we, these are the generators and they generate um, all paths here uh, are, are distinct. So next, uh, so the identity morphism, zero times next, one time, next, next, two times, next, 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 et cetera. That's all in this category. And the functor maps it all over into set in, in a way that only requires us to specify it for next because of the composition, uh, the compositional, uh, compositionality is honored by function. Do you remember all that? Okay, so. Yes, that's right. That's right. Just by specifying the functor, um, 
uh, even though it only specified it for the generators for next, it gave us, it, it told us all the information we need to iterate the dynamical system arbitrarily many times. The story wasn't quite as interesting with composition here because there wasn't anything that composes other than like ID with source and source with ID and that sort of stuff, right? Okay, but today we're gonna to be doing something different. Today we're gonna to be talking about a notion that is so important conceptually in category theory, but, but is really key at a practical, useful level when reasoning about these, uh, these structures. Um, and by manipulating them categorically, we have an essence of elegance in describing, okay? We can capture them in a very pithy, elegant way, um, these relationships between structures. And, the, and it has to do with this notion of a structure preserving transformation between structures. Uh, between these encoded structures. So a structure preserving transformation by which one graph can be related to another. They're not the same graphs, but they may, that that one preserves the structure of the other. Maybe it's embedded in it, for example, or maybe it's basically embedded, but it collapses some distinctions in the original one. Um, this is what we're gonna be talking about today. And it may sound very specific to graphs, but. Um, don't don't get confused about that. While it will apply to graphs, it will apply to many other structures as well. It will apply to stock flow diagrams. It will apply to state charts. It will apply to structures associated with dynamical systems, et cetera. This notion of sort of homomorphism, of, of a structure preserving mapping. Um, uh, and it's going to be both elegant, very practical, and useful. And it's going to be really useful in things like stratification. Um, it's And uh, another variant of it, um, so the dual of it will be useful uh, in some other, other contexts as well, okay, with like uh, push-ups, sticking things together, et cetera. Um, and... Um, we're going to see that this notion of homomorphism is really useful when we talk about the structure of dynamic models, right? Remember, we talk about structure determines behavior mm -hmm. in dynamic modeling. And we can reason about not models in isolation, not models as solitudes upon themselves in some fragmented way, but models existing in relationship to one another, having commonalities, having having um, a way in which one model is like another model, but more detailed. They're like another model, but coarse grains, it, it, it aggregates it up. And this gives us a language for doing it mm -hmm. and for manipulating. So with your leave, I'm gonna now jump into that. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so let's let's interweave these things. So I'm gonna call up my Docker container mm -hmm. and I'm gonna start it up, okay? Um, Okay. Start me up. Okay. Um, that's what Bill Gates said at the launch of Windows 3.0. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so I'm gonna click on this and I'm gonna call up a uh, a window here, which is going to, okay, I'm exhibiting. Um, oh, I see. It's using two different, oh no, I need to, okay. It's it's treating me as having two screens, and it should not be. I need only one screen. Okay, this is this is not going to be uh, good. Okay, either I take my chance, or I stop Zoom recording and I restart um, the Zoom recording. Uh, can I? Let me let me stop sharing. That's what I'll do, and then I will go and I will just set it to be one screen so I can see all my windows and then we'll go again, here we go. Here we go and now we'll share screen again, okay. And I think we'll be in good shape now. Hey, come on, okay, okay. So let's try this again, boom. Uh, okay, why, why am I not, uh, here we go. Okay, so here's my Jupyter notebook. Did you get that up? Uh, Jupiter notebook? Okay. Um, great. 
<clears throat> so I had shared with you via Zoom those two files, right? Um, files which show you in Master Click Build. Um, so I'm going to go here and I'm going to upload those into my Jupyter Notebook. Right? So I'm running this Jupyter Notebook within this Docker container. I click there, get up the Jupyter Notebook, and I have to upload my files so it, I can manipulate them in that. Is that okay? And now we have to do something a little bit more subtle. We have to, or at least a little bit more, um, uh, more specific. We need to create a new folder and this should be called IMG. Uh -huh. And we're gonna go into IMG. How did that I do that? I did new new folder. Mm -hmm. Went into IMG and I'm gonna upload here. And I'm gonna put in the other thing I put in, which was mumble. Um, um mumble, where is it? Uh, here it is, naturality square rotate. Yes. Okay. Now this is based on one of the co-instructors, namely myself's preferred way of thinking about these things. There's nothing privileged. In the book, it's shown one way, I've shown it another way, but um, uh, it'll go along with a lot of my other illustrations. Okay, so we've just uploaded those, right? Here's the here's the notebook, the uh, Julia notebook, right? Which we're gonna be running. Here's the image, you know, um, which is gonna be used by the notebook. It, it, it's gonna need it. Um, and I'm gonna double click on the notebook to start up that notebook, okay? Okay, so, We're going to depart a little bit from what we did last time. Last time we defined our own graph schema. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. We defined our, a, a graph schema and then we defined what's called an AC set type. Mm -hmm. Attributed C set type. So something that knows about a type of thing that's a C set mapping from that particular schema to set. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what we did last time. We defined that, and then we we use that to define a schema. And here, we're going to do something a little bit different just to get some extra bells and whistles, some, some affordances. To wit, we're going to use a built-in one for graphs, OK? Um, just so that the pictures are nicer and so we can see, see some of these uh, mappings, these homomorphisms, these structure preserving mappings from one graph to another be really nicely illustrated. And you'll forgive me, but um, this could be done if we define it from ground up, but the pictures wouldn't be nearly as rich. Um, and uh, we wanted to illustrate it graphically. Are we okay with that? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna execute the first line. There's using CatLab. And then um, you know, Shayana showed me that you can insert marks down here. Um, probably for you young people, you know all about this. Yeah, but just same, just run it. So yeah. Just so you can actually run these things, uh, I guess, and it will just go forward. Okay. So we're going to now look at the built in schema. Do you remember what the schema for graph is? Mm -hmm. Who can remind me? What is it? It's GR. What is it? It consists. Ed edge is an object. The objects are edge mm -hmm. and vertex. And there's a morphism source. For, and what's the, so that morphism comes from where? Edge, edge. And it goes to vertex, yeah. Right, and 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 yeah, and there's a target one. That's then there's identities. For every object, there's identities, right? Do you remind me today that a student say the state like in the stock flow, like paragraphs is stock is uh, vertex. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, so, uh, okay, so we're going to visualize that schema as built in by by um, um, by CatLab. Do you recognize that? Yeah. Okay, should be pretty familiar, right? So it's uh, it's one of these. It just knows extra well how to display that, um, how to display instances. So can we go? create a, a little graph with us, just building on our memory from last time. So you tell me, this is the AC set type here for this. Um, 
what is this graph going to be? You tell me what's in this graph. Well, look at look at the declaration of the AC set of the uh, the C set. So this is a mapping from this schema to set, right? Or to kind of skeleton and um, set. And how many vertices does it have? Three vertices. Three. How many edges? Three. Three. And tell me where the edges, each edge in turn, tell me its source and target. How about edge one? One to two. One to two. Two to three. And three to three. So what, what would it look like kind of as a graph? Yeah. Like one, two, and then the last one. Well, so one to two. Two to three, and then three to three, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's let's bear that out. You ready? Mm -hmm. So that's how you read this, right? This is remember sources of source is going to be mapped over to a function. Source uh, uh, this source is a morphism in, in the schema category. So so when we map, remember each morphism in the schema category gets mapped to a morphism in in set. And what's a morphism in set? It's a function. And this defines the function, right? And it's a function from what? That function over in set that's mapped to by source, that function maps from what to what? Uh, well, okay, it's called source. Um, the function is called, so, so we map it over into set, but that's a function and it's a function maps from a set as input. Uh, the domain is a set and the codomain is that. What's its domain? What's what's the set? Source. The set of sources, domain, and domain is a set of targets. Mm -hmm. So this is a this maps so, over to a function. I think the domain is the, the vertex. And the, the domain is the, the domain is edges, right? Okay. Right. Yeah, edge to vertex. Because it source goes from okay. edge, okay. so it maps from the set of edges to the set of vertices, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um. So remember, a functor. Just as review from last time, a functor maps objects in the in the source category. A functor from category C to category D. In this case, from this category to set maps each object in the source so so each object in the in in, in here in the schema to a set right mm -hmm. so there's going to be a set of edges of size 3 a set of vertices of size 3 right mm -hmm. and then each of so this source morphism is going to map it maps morphisms in the here in the schema to morphisms in set which are functions mm -hmm. And those functions map from 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 those the, the, from their codomain from their domain, which in this for sources E, the set of edges to the set of vertices. Right. Yes. I, I know it's a bit the terminology is a bit confusing because we want to say the source of the yeah. function, and but it's already called source, and so I just wanted to be very clear. Let's call it domain. In codomain, are we okay with that? Yeah. Okay. And then we when we talk about a morphism, and it's a domain. That's the thing whence it comes, and a codomain. That's the thing whither it goes, to which it goes. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, domain is the thing um, that its input, and this is its in the codomain is its output. You could say it that way, right? Okay. So that's what that's. So you told me. Okay, uh, where those edges are. The first goes one to two. Uh, sorry, where those? Uh, yes, yeah. we have to be careful. The edges in the in the graph, in turn, um, uh, the for the first of those edges, that source is one and its target is two. Uh, for the second of the edges, that source is two, its target is three. For the the third edge, its source is uh, the source vertex is three and the target vertex is three. Are we okay with that? Yeah. Okay, so let's let's do that. And and there we are. And it's here printed as a as a uh, as a little uh, database, but it doesn't show it show you a node of vertices because that doesn't it only has a primary key column. Mm -hmm. And here it is shown in all of its glory. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. 
glorious, right? Okay, are we okay with that? Okay, um, how about this next graph? What is that gonna have? How many vertices? Four vertices, six edges. You got it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. I'm not going to ask you to visualize that in your head. It's late in the day. Um, and um, and so I, I, I run that. And now I'm going to display it. And we see something real pretty like, right? Um, uh, it's so uh, how many vertices do we have? Four. How many edges do we have? Six. And they're all nicely labeled and so on. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? It does a good job laying these things out to graph this. And by the way, these are the things that are allowed by this built-in graph because normally it wouldn't know how, because if you think about it, as Evan Patterson says, you really the, the you know original creator of Cat Lab, um, when, when you show C-sets, think stock flows, think dynamical systems, think graphs, think Petri nets, all, you know, often these have very idiosyncratic ways of showing a given type, right? Like, like we built up through decades preferred ways of showing stock flow diagrams or, or graphs. And it doesn't automatically, if you define an arbitrary seat set, it doesn't automatically know your preferences. So it's very hard in general to have a perfect way of showing a C set that's just the accords with the, you know, conventions. But for graphs, it wanted to nail it. It wanted to have a really good way of displaying it. That's why they built it, one of the reasons they built it. And that's one of the reasons, the primary reason we're using it, because it has a nice way of displaying graphs as he says. Are we okay with that? Mm -hmm. But all the category theory is the same. It's just, and, and I think basically they can write extensions to graph viz that operate on certain types of C sets. I think yeah, that's I mean, how they do it. Yeah, the things like if you redefine the, like the, the schema is the the process following their way is actually they have a structure of how to represent a graph or right. something so we need to follow that way to define that but i don't yeah, yeah. but i mean basically i think we could for example with stock flow mm -hmm. if we wanted to display it in just our sort of way we could write custom code yeah. for cat lab yeah. to that would know they would say, oh, this is a stock flow C set. I know how to display that. And it would display it all in the nice sort of yeah. nice sort of squarish way, as Eugenia Chen might say. Um, okay. Um, okay. Okay. Now, now we come to the heart of today's discussion. We're building up, recalling the basics from last time. And now we're at the moment of truth. And now we need to talk about map structure preserving mappings between C sets for the, the same scheme of category C. Right? Um, we're talking like for a graph, structure preserving mappings between graphs. Mm -hmm. Or we could think in other cases of structure preserving mappings between stock flow diagrams or structure preserving mappings between. Petri nuts or structure preserving ma mappings between dynamical systems. Mm -hmm. um, so same schema, you have two instances, one instance, another, and you're asking, is there a structure preserving mapping or how many are there? Mm -hmm. yes. These are interesting questions because we want to be able to view these denizens of the world, these, these different instances of a schema not as, you know, just one-off solitudes, right? Fragmented things, each in isolation. We want to relate them to one another. And the primary way we relate them is that they have the same structure. They retain the same structure. So maybe one stock flow diagram is an aggregated version of another. Maybe it gloms together, or maybe, maybe for like a system structure diagram where we have stocks and flows. Maybe it gloms together the exposed and the infected stock. Mm. Or maybe it gloms, to, it sticks together asymptomatic infections and symptomatic infections, just gloms them together. 
and we'd still say, well, you know, it's basically the same structure, but this one's coarser, this one's rougher. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to be looking at here. Structure preserving mappings between instances. Are we ready for that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so this is, so you tell me, a C set. What is that mathematically? Um, it's a what between a schema category and set. It's a what? Fill in the blank. It's a functor. It's a functor. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's a functor, right? Um, I'll tell you my, my spouse a couple of years ago, she said, like, why are you always listening to people, to videos about functors? They keep on saying functor. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. uh, she's very she's yeah, very like aware of the significance of why, why watch the videos about the, the, from uh, like Evan or uh, other yeah. people my boyfriend said what is functor <laughs> yeah and so studying. <laughs> so so these are functors yeah. from from schema category to set right yeah. um and each each instance a given graph is a functor from a schema category to set, right? A particular functor, right? Yeah. Maps vertices to a particular set of vertices, E to a particular set of edges, right? Mm -hmm. And source and target to very particular functions specific to that case, right? Mm -hmm. Each one is a different functor, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what we're gonna be talking about here is transformations between them that relate them and these transformations going from one functor from from a, a schema a given schema category to set to another functor from the same schema category to set a, a, a functor a, a mapping between them the preserved structure is called a what a mapping natural between transformation. natural transformation and but here it's a special type, right? It's a, it's a natural transformation, not of any category C and D. It's one where we have a schema category and, and so a category C and set, right? Mm -hmm. So it's called an AC set transformation here. And it's from this graph to this graph, right? Mm -hmm. They're for the same schema. That's very important, right? We're, we're not doing something wild, like, like having a, like having a, you know, a mapping from a stock flow diagram to a, to a, you know, a Petri nut or something like that. No, no, no. Um, we, that, that's a later topic. <laughs> not, not now. Right. Um, uh, here we're, we're, we're going to be, that would be like a data migration <laughs> functor. <laughs> um, uh, but here we're doing between two graphs. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay. Now let's learn how to read these. Can we do this? Okay, can we do it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's graph graph A, graph B. Mm -hmm. And now we're, we have to say something about how they're related. Mm -hmm. Which are the preserved structures. Yeah, yeah, to, to preserve the structure. Now, I, I want you to recall that graph A has how many vertices? And how many edges? Two. So for each vertex, we state the vertex of graph B into which it into which it goes. So in a natural transformation, here between these functors, we're gonna be specifying a function in set that relates them. That says, that, that says the vertex number one in graph, in graph A, which vertex does it go to in graph B? Hmm? It goes to one. Graph vertex number two in graph A, to what vertex does it go in graph B? Two. Mm -hmm. This one uh, for vertex number th number three 
and, the, and I'm saying three because it's the third position here. In graph A, to what vertex does it go in, in uh, graph B? Three. And the same thing for each of the edges, okay? Um, uh, now, I, I want... I want to remind you a little bit at the cost of of showing some some slides here um, uh, about about this issue and and now now I'm in trouble. Okay, not that one, Jenna. Not that one. Um, okay, um, not this one either. Okay, where's where are my slides on natural transformations? No, not this one. Okay, now now I'm in now I'm in in real trouble. No, 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 no. Where did, where did they all go? Okay, now I'm in bad, bad shape. Is it, are they up here? No, no. Okay. So, oh, I saw it. I saw it for a second. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Why is it sitting up in an outward space? Okay, let's get down here. Get it down. Okay, there we go. Okay. So some of you may remember this. It was actually at the end of, towards the end of our joy of abstraction course. And the way I like it, I, I don't know of any better, better exposition, better intuition for this than to talk about what Bartosz Milewski talks about, right? Bartosz describes natural transformations as kind of in a very graphical way where he says like, you know, you have some abstract representation like of a figure <laughs> and, and then you have, and, and that's our kind of source category, okay? And a given functor is a mapping from that source category, say C, into a, the same target category. So here it's in this one, when we say set. And this one maps, uh, that's one functor, F. This is another functor, G, okay? And I like how he says it like, the natural transformation relates these two. So this one maybe sends the head of this kind of stick figure into the head of the human. This one sends the head of the stick figure into the head of a dog, which is drawn in a rather evocative way, right? Um, uh, and the natural transformation says basically, hey, this is how you translate from the body part of the person to the body part of the corresponding body part of the dog, right? So. Each component of the, you note this in the natural transformation, it has a component, in this case, a function, right? Um, uh, for each of these items here. Mm -hmm. So it says the head of a human translates to the head of a dog. The left hand of a human translates to the left paw of a dog. The right leg of a human translates to, I guess it would be this one, translates to the right or the right <laughs> rear leg of the dog, right? Um, so a natural transformation kind of relates where something goes under F to where it goes under G, functor G. Do you get that idea? Mm -hmm. It kind of says for, for each thing mapped to where it goes from F, what's the corresponding thing for G? Do you get that idea? Yes. Um, and, and in functional programming, it's it's kind of a similar uh, idea. So, you know, F sends things over and to, to, to targets, this is where it sends A, this is where it sends B. And the natural transformation is that kind of mapping, the sort of Rosetta Stone that says, this is how you translate an F thing, an F of it to a G of it. Do you get that notion? You could also think of it as like, uh, in maps or or something like that. Anyway, I thought I had some like, pictures, but I, I guess okay. Um, okay, so let's go back to our little little exercise if we can here. Okay, now, now I'm in, in trouble. Okay, um, so uh, how do I? Here we are. Okay, so this is saying this is saying from where <laughs> GA where uh, from vertex one for GA where it sent, you know, where, where GA sent vertex, um, it has to, that it sends it to, to vertices one, two, three, for each of them, it has to translate it into the corresponding one in uh, G, in vertex in G. This says how to translate each of where GA sent the edges into the corresponding ones in G, in GB. You got that? Yeah. So it's this Rosetta Stone. It says how to translate 
it in the language of GA to the language of GB. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we if we uh, and GA, what's happening? Sorry, if you said. And, uh, we, we oh, G of B and GA. We well, we're gonna see that. We're gonna see some what will happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. Let's let's go. Let's go. Now, the point is, we're talking about building up understanding. But the incredibly powerful thing is CatLab and Ellsbury Julia are, are categorical computing platforms. So they can do a lot of this reasoning for us. We're going to just see how it relates to the, to the core reason. Are we ready? Okay. So we're going to define this natural transformation, right? It's a natural transformation for these functors, which are from a CSAT. That's why it's a CSAT transformation. Um, and we'll get to attributes. Okay. And now we're going to plot it out. And this is due to Sean Wu, um, my esteemed colleague at, at Merck. Um, he added this thing to CatLab. Now, this is shown kind of upside down from, from this case. But what it shows is, so what is this thing here? What is this here thing? Can you tell me? What is Okay, but what what is this lower box? You know, one step at a time. What is this lower box? It is a GA. GA. This is GA, right? GA. Okay, but what's this top one? GB. GB. And what do you think the dotted lines say? I think no one may have been getting at it. Uh huh. Yeah, but map each. Yeah. Each vertices will correspond to Yeah, exactly. It says how to map. The vertices here to the vert right mm -hmm. where the head of the human maps to the head of the dog, right? Mm -hmm. Where the right leg of the human maps to the rear right leg of the dog, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Um, and the tail of the you know, well, never mind. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, uh, the the coccyx uh, of the human maps the tail of the dog. Okay. Um. Okay. Um. Okay, um, and what's not shown explicitly, but here we can read off, is that one edge one goes to edge one, edge two goes to edge two, edge three goes to edge three as well. Okay, you, you can kind of read these off here, right? Mm -hmm. Why is this a blank three? You're going to tell me why is this a blank three? What what why do I list three things here? Why don't I list Six things or something. G. Sorry? GA. Yeah, there's one value in here for each of the edge, well, edges of GA, or one value here for each of the vertices of GA, right? Could this, so um, do these numbers always have to be one, two, three? No, right. Um, this could be as big as what? I'm not saying it's a legitimate AC set transformation, but it could be. Uh, it could be given GB. It could be as big as for for E. Yeah. As big as what? Six, right? Because there there's six possible. But but here's the thing: because not every mapping is a structure preserving mapping, so we have to be careful here, right? And that's what we're going to be exploring together. But this is a graph homomorphism. This is a structure preserving mapping, right? And we're gonna explore this. Here, we have preserved, it's like we've embedded. Do you see this? This structure in this. Do you see that? Yeah. Like we have, we, we've retained, you know, the, the ordering here, right? Here, this goes to this, this goes to this, right? Just like we preserve the basic structure, the human in the dog, right? We have the like left arm, the right arm, the four, four, our, the four <laughs> legs, the dog, right? Right? Um, we preserve the basic likeness of this in here. We've kind of embedded it, right? <clears throat> but we could actually do more than that. Like we could collapse things down. And we're going to explore this more. It's a little bit more subtle. But do you, do you, do, does it have face plausibility that this, we've kind of preserved this in here? 
we preserve GA and GB. Do you, do you, do you kind of see at an intuition level that that's at least plausible? Do you agree that not every way I could map these things would preserve its likeness? Like, tell me something, a weird scrambled thing that I, that, that really wouldn't preserve its likeness. What, what could I do that would screw things up terribly? It, it, it clearly wouldn't preserve its likeness. It, it, it wouldn't capture it. Hmm? Tell me, tell me one mapping here that would. Uh -huh. Two to four, yeah. and then three to. Excellent, three. excellent. Like, because there's no way to get from one to. Yeah, so one to one, but two to four. Now we need some way of going from one to two, but we don't have a way of going from one to four to 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 the to what they map to. Right? Do, you, do you see that? Or if I made one map to three and two map to four then it, it, you can't get there from here, right? Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that this notion of natural transformation is actually a very strong notion. It may look trivial here, but it's actually it, it's actually quite, quite deep. And, it, and you can't just scramble them in any old way. It's not that any old mapping will preserve it, that this is just, you know, um, that that you can be loosey-goosey and, and map it. No, no, no. Yeah. The way that's worked was not an accident, and uh, it and and it requires us to think things through. You know what's a legitimate mapping? Do you get that? And the the criteria for this are captured in this diagram, and I'll I'll post my slides here. But um, uh, you know, for the criteria, the naturality condition basically is going to relate these um. At these mappings, okay, so it's it. There are these naturality squares that need to be matched. Now, these are showing the naturality squares for this particular case, okay. Um, and in general, it's a it's here. If we consider um, a morphism, like from a from the head to the hand, right? Either we can map it over to F, do that there, and then map down with the natural transformation alpha. So head to hand in F, and then map down, and we get the left paw of the dog. That has to be the same as taking the head, that's FA, performing the natural transformation on that, getting the head of the dog, and then mapping to its paw on the dog anatomy. We have to get the same result for these to be viewed as as a for this to be viewed as a structure preserving mapping alpha this natural transmit to be natural it has to preserve that do you get that okay okay so let's talk about it for arrows and vertices can we is that okay okay let's talk about it for arrows and vertices so what does this mean for an arrow well okay let, let's think if we have two graphs G and H, right? We have two graphs. Hmm? Um, in our case, we call them GA, GB, but just imagine their name is G and H, okay? That graph functor, G and H, each of them, if, if we say G of arrow, what does that give us? The set of arrows, right, for a graph G, right? Mm -hmm. And G of vertex gives the set of vertices, right? We comfortable with that? An H of arrow gives us the set of of arrows for graph for graph H, H. and H of vertex gives us the set of vertices for graph. Are we comfortable with that? Okay. So for the for these two graphs encoded by G and encoded by H, for those to have this homomorphism between them, the structure preserving mapping between them, alpha. We need the Rosetta Stone. We need the way of translating the head of one into the head of the other, the hand of one into the front paw of the other. Do you get that? Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. So let's 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 make sure we understand it because it's going to come down to a very basic idea here, right? Um, for the arrow. 
if we consider a set of arrows, right? That's what G of, of arrow is, right? So said, what's G of source? So if we consider a given arrow, what's G of source gonna map it to? It's gonna map it to the what? G of source is a function, right? It's jo the job of that function, the, the job in life of that function is to map the set of arrows to the set of vertices, right? In G. Um, so if we take a given arrow in G and we hit it, we, we, we ask what's G of source of it, we're gonna get a given what? A vertex where it starts, right? Where that arrow starts. We can't get the, the source of that arrow, right? Where it starts. In G, in G. Right? And if then we map it over to H with the natural transformation, we see where does this, where does that vertex go in H, right? That has to give the same result for it not to be scrambled in some weird way. That has to give the same result as if I started with that 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 arrow of uh, that edge in, in, in G and I mapped it over to the corresponding edge in age. And then I took its source. Do you get that? Mm -hmm. So so we have to preserve the source of our arrows. If we said this arrow goes to um to this guy here, right? Um, um uh this guy here to 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 this arrow here, it has to be that we map the, the source of that arrow over in a way that's compatible with that, right? After all, it has to map over to four, right? If if this arrow one goes to this this arrow six, it has to be that its source goes to, to the source of that. Do you get that? Yeah. Um, so we can't just willy-nilly, you know, just map these things over um, in some scrambled way. It's not like we can map, oh, vertices totally separate from edges. They have to go together. It has to cohere it has to it has to be consistent right and that means we need to meet this condition if we take the source of an arrow in g that has to map the equivalent of that in h has to be the source of of that equivalent arrow in h that equivalent edge in h does that make sense yes and the same thing for dest the destination right we we need to map these things in ways that are that are consistent, right? To, to, are you comfortable with that idea for the, for our case? We can't just say, well, one is this guy, but you know, one that arrow one here, or call edge one here, goes to edge six. So if this is G and this is H, edge one, we can't just say, well, one will go to six here and vertex one will go to this guy. No, that would be crazy. Like a it's nonsensical. It's incoherent, right? It's it doesn't hang together. It's not consistent. For it to be a homomorphism, a structure preserving mapping, they need to follow. Do you get that? Yes. Mm. Mm. And sometimes things can come out of this that aren't aren't obvious. Like you might think, well, you know, um, um maybe we map one to three and two to four, um, and we map one to six, well, that would violate it because then we don't have the source of this guy lining up with the source, the equivalent to the source. Of this guy. So I like to think of it as kind of a Rosetta Stone, but I also like this, right? Especially like how we drew the, the, yeah. <laughs> the model. Sense, yeah. yeah. That, the so, so it's like um, this, you know, the, the, the vertex in, in this graph um uh so so the edge in this graph if you consider its equivalent edge in the other graph they have to share the compatible sources right um it, you you have to map the sources and the vertices in ways that cohere in ways that are consistent and if you ask about the source of an edge in g um, and where that maps to it has to map to the same thing as considering the equivalent of that edge in h and taking its source. It all has to hang together. Can you kind of consider it? Mm. Um, right now in 214, we're trying to convince students that 
when they learn a new programming language, they're not learning a language like English to French, but rather a different dialect of mm. English. Mm. Could you consider it like that? Oh, well, that's interesting. In a way, yeah, because, well, at least these are from the same uh, schema. Like, yeah. But I will say this, there will be, as we'll see, there'll be cases where there's no, like, these two things don't have a homomorphism between them. There, there are cases like that where you can't, you know, there, there's no direct word for it or something like that, um, or there's no direct translation, right? Um, uh, okay, so um, so we just asked, is this natural? It is natural. It it matches. So in in um, in CatLab, it knows how to check naturality. Yes. So yeah. So the is natural is a built in um, function in CatLab. Yeah. yeah, and and then. There's here we're we're actually checking these things, Let right? Um uh explicitly, right? Um if you perform uh the source uh or if you if you perform the source in G and then you map it over to H, it has to be the same as performing the source uh in or mapping the arrow over an H and then perform or mapping the over arrow to H and then performing the source in it. Right? Yeah. And I mean, think back to Eugenia Chang's description. We we want it to be well behaved, right? If it didn't meet this, how could you say that they're that they're compatible, right? And that they, they just don't preserve that structure. It's scrambled in some weird way, right? Um and and Shayan beautifully gives this code which does this. So we have alpha vertex, and you notice that each of these says, okay, for this, okay, you can perform, you can map over the, so this is saying where each of them is mapped to, each of the vertices is mapped to, and we can take the source of each of those. Alternatively, we could um, uh, here, and oh, and this is the, the right, so okay, so, so here we're um, mapping over, uh, do, 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 do. The rights okay help me show you in here oh um, sorry uh yeah yeah so yeah the the uh i i think i should see it's left so that is in the equation oh sorry that's the right uh -huh. so yeah that's the right side that this is this yeah, one yeah so it, it's it's um yeah um and so you're using this you're using this mapping on G source, you're composing those functions. Yes. So the G source, it would yeah. say like we, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. It's like we start from the edges, all edges of the, of the, of the, of the uh, graph A, because yes. the, the graph A is the functor J. Right. Yeah. Then the G source give us all, all the source uh, vertices. Of the graph, right? J A and H, yeah, and then alpha vertex map all those source vertexes to the vertexes in H. In H, and that's yeah. what's expressing this yes. thing here. Yes, and then you go through and you the left. you you do the left side of that, yeah. and you're basically asking, does the square commute? Because that's what we're looking for yeah. here. We're looking. Does this commute? That's what the check mark means. You could go either this way or go this way, and you get the same results. Um, and um, and you know here, that's what's expressed in these naturality squares. That that oh, th it's not shown here, but that's there's only a, the last one. Yeah. Uh, there's there need this needs to yeah. commute. Yeah. So there's that we could put a plus next time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and and by the way, this matches the example in the book. It's just it's just uh, you know, rotated you know, per my 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 predilection, and for for it to be consistent with this, uh, and for it to be consistent with this guy. Uh, so, are people comfortable with that? Yes. Okay. Now, um, similarly, here's the right hand side. We we need to check that it hold. This was for source. Now we're we're checking for target and we're asking are both of them true. Okay. So we we were just checking there those naturality squares. Mm -hmm. 
um, we're just checking these things to you. Uh, for all font morphisms, all morphisms F in the source category. What is the source category here? Sanity check. What's the source category? The source category here, we're dealing with functors from a common source category. It's, I'll give you a hint. It's a schema category. Set. Yeah, so, so what is our source category here for our functors? We have two functors, which are what? They're, each of the graphs is a functor from what? To set. Well, each graph is a functor from C to D. Well, what is C though? Graph. It's GR. Yeah. Right? It's 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 GR. It's 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 this schema, right? Schema. Each graph is a C set, right? From GR to set. Right, right. I mean, yes. Are we are we on board with that? Yes. Each graph is encoded as one of the as a mapping from this to set. It has a certain set of arrows, certain set of vertices, a certain mapping from arrows to vertices. It says for each mm -hmm. arrow, what is the corresponding vertex, and for each, um, if that's the, for the source of that arrow for the target. Are we are we uncomfortable with that? Well, my meaning is that for each, so we have a common category here, right? GR, right? Mm -hmm. Each functor is, is GR being mapped into set, right? Mm -hmm. And the naturality condition for it to be natural, to have a natural transformation, for any morphism over here in the source category, in this case, for source and for target, those are all the morphisms over, or, or, all the heteromorphisms over, all the non trivial ones. This is A from A to B. We're going to map to the set. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. And we have a morphism to the A to B. Right. So yes. C here is GR, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. This is set, right? Yeah, this is set. And that is um, well, we're calling it here F, but it's source. And and I'm saying uh, or F is target. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and all I'm saying is this shows the general case that for any morphism over here, in this case in GR, for every morphism, it has to be that it's got, you've got this translation, this Rosetta Stone, this consistent way of translating func one functor to another, uh, the functor F to functor G. In that case, we say we have a natural transformation between them. And that's why Shaoyan in this code is beautifully checking is this natural? Do both these naturally squares hold? And we have to hold, have this hold for every morphism in this source category in GR. And the two morphisms in GR are arrow, uh, sorry, uh, or, excuse me, are, are the two morphisms are target and source. That's why we're checking does the naturality square hold? Do we have a way of translating? you know, from, from the head to the to the hand. Do we have the way of translating from the head to the pinky uh, or the head, the head to the left foot, from the head to the right foot? Do we have a way of translating that's fully consistent for every one of those source morphisms? So if there have been three heteromorphisms, three morphisms in this thing from this, we would have had to, Make sure that it holds for all of them. Are you comfortable with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, um, so we we're checking this, and and she's going very carefully for each of the squares, going very carefully through each of the conditions, and making sure this is true. So right now, this is for source, but after that, she'll do it for target. Are we okay with that? Mm -hmm. Because it has to hold for every morphism in, in here. And, and that's a very strong condition. 
a very strong connection that we have this like Rosetta Stone for going from what people look like to what dogs look like. Do you agree? That's a really powerful thing, right? You say, oh, that nerve in a person, it goes to this nerve in the dog. That's a really powerful thing. Do you get that? That's a really powerful thing to happen. Okay, now, the beautiful thing is as a categorical computing platform in CatLab. I like this. Automatically find the, the homomorphisms. It can find the homomorphisms yeah. automatically. Yes. Automatic automatically. Um yeah. right. Yeah. Um so here we go. Um we say tell us all homomorphisms. Tell us all mappings. Let's let's be clear what this means. All mappings of this sort from this graph into this one, where they where preserve structure. Could you give me another one? Could you just try to come up with with another one that that might might hold? You've told me somewhere it wouldn't, and and that's important because it's very important to realize it. One, one map to three, two map to two, three, uh, three map to three. No, no. Yeah, three map to three. Yeah. Okay, so. Like uh, one, one, two, one, two, three. One, one two, map to three. So vertex one, yeah, vertex one, one maps to vertex three. Three. Vertex two maps to vertex uh, two, and then three, three map to three. That's... Three map to three. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah right. Yes, um. Right. So one to three, mm -hmm. two to two, yeah, and three to three. Yeah. But let's let's just informally think about that, right? Um. Yeah. So if that's the case, first of all, is there is there a plausible thing to which one the edge one could go? Yeah, there is. There's there's something going from three to two. Okay, okay. So that'd be four. It would need to map to four, right? Um, and is there something then, given that two map to two and three to three, is there something going from two to three? You know, the equivalent of where two maps to, and to three map to, is there an edge going between the two, right? Mm -hmm. And it's two, yes, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, so there could be. Um, that it preserves the source in the target vertices. Yes. So the edge three in the um mm. the lower ah one. yes yeah it's edge that three. Map to the identity still. Well, the thing is that there's no um, identity in this I mean, graph. I yeah. think the thing is it mapped to identity. I I think the thing is like the function has to be the morphism of three also has to be like like so, so, yeah, so what I yeah. mean is because the identity is mapped to, mm. yeah, it's, it's you mean yeah. by identity, you mean the self? No, this is not that's identity. not an identity. That's not an identity. I was, I was yeah. wondering, it's like I was wondering if I could map into identity and I could put three to one. And, right, I know what you mean. Yeah, you're saying it's each of these have a secret one. No, yeah, I don't think so. No, there... I mean, since this three is not yeah. an identity, look, I think this is not an identity yeah. morphism. Right, yeah. right. It's it's important to realize that these are graphs. They're not morphisms. Okay. Like yeah. there, this is not a, this is, this is not a... itself yeah. depicting a category. Yeah. It's not a presentation of a category. It's a graph, yeah. and unless there's a self ed it's not there automatically. It's not like this is a presentation of a category. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, yeah. But if we could list these out, right? Um, okay, so here one, two, three goes to one, two, three. Does that sound familiar? So mm -hmm. as you as what you said, then three must must map to three. Because three has the right. self yeah, and that added. three yeah. can and only then, go to three. And look at that. Oh, yeah. Look at that. All of the threes they 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 they, they so. So three, three always will go to three, mm -hmm. but the others can go to different ones, Ujia, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and let's go, you know, we can look at these and kind of try to grok it, but we can draw them out, right? Take a look at this. Do you recognize this one? That's the yeah. one we've been dealing with. Let's go to the next. 
By the way, you notice we're just indexing into those set of homomorphisms, right? We well, all we have to do is call homomorphism, and we here's another one, right? Right. Um. So this one goes to this one. This one goes to this one. Oh, wait a minute. It's showing it upside down. Now. Yeah, it's, it's arbitrarily. Okay. Yeah. So so one goes to three, two goes to two, and three goes to three. I think Uche has said that before. That was what Uche has said, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's 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 check this one out. Can we do it? Um, so here's three. One can go to two. Two can go to two, and three can go to three. Notice all as UJ have pointed out, three has to go to three because there's no other with a self loop, right? Let's check out four. Here we go. One to go to, wow, that's a nice curved arrow. Look at that. Pretty slick, okay? One goes to three, two goes to three, and three goes to three. Hmm? Why is that? How can that happen? Where do you think arrow one maps to? Remember, this is showing where the vertices map, but the, the edges here in this graph have to map to things consistent with that, right? That preserve the source and target. So where does one, what edge does one match to? Well, uh, so uh, Mehdi is right. One edge, one here maps to which edge here? Three. Hmm? It, it goes to itself. Yes. And where does two map to? Three as well, right? Um, and in fact, you can kind of read it off up here if you were see edge, it all go to edge three. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is the list of where edges go to, right? Um, cool or not? Cool, cool. Uh, I think, I think, it, I think it's the cat's meow think or the dog's meow. meow. Um, okay, okay. <laughs> the dog's bark or something. Okay, and this one, one can go to four, two can go to three, and three can go to three. Structure preserving mappings. Do you agree that you can't scramble them? You can't, yeah. I mean, this is very specific, but it's not just there's only one, right? Now, as Xiao Yan does, this is just masterful what Xiao Yan has done here. Um, Xiao Yan is is the, the queen. Um, so here we can say, well, look, um we we want it to be monic. Yeah, um <laughs> And so instead of <laughs> homomorphisms, <laughs> we're in general we're going to get mo yes. monomorphisms. Is that a name? Monomorphisms. Yeah, yeah. monomorphisms. Mo oh, sorry, mono. Mono. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry for my English. <laughs> mono. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the mono. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. I just yeah. I didn't realize it. Yeah. Um, mono. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay, so here we are constraining each of the, we're constraining each of the vertices to go to, they can't be, they can't, uh, they can't collide. They can't be mapped to the same. It must be one to one. one, to one. one. And the same thing with the edges, I think. Each yes. of them has to map also to a distinct one. Yeah, I mean, the syntax is if we write monic equals true, that means the the monomorphism holds for all the objects. For but, all the objects, for edges and for vertices. Yeah, but if we can also write like monic equals bracket yeah. V, then that means it's only um, eligible for the object of V. So I, I, I see. Like, yeah. Um, right, so we could say only make force it to be monic for well, S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can also define which objects it only applies for. Yeah. Okay. Um, and as Shoyan notes, that's the morphism we manually defined. Yeah. Just you know, mm -hmm. um, simple, but actually a quite, I, I you know very nice properties, but it's a quite special case among all homomorphisms. So I, I hope this will get you a sense that homomorphisms are special things. 
they preserve structure, but they're not so strong to give us only one possible thing that often we have a number of them, but homomorphisms that further have certain properties like monomorphisms, something we might call a momomorphism. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, uh, that a uh, homomorphism um, that has extra properties might be unique or might not exist in a conceivable. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, it might not exist in general. Um, yeah. So I think I'll ask you, okay, so so zoom out for a minute. We've been talking about, we've been talking here about graphs, right? But I, I want you to reflect on the power here because nothing we've done is specific is total is specific to graphs. So we happen to have had nice plotting affordances to, to see them pretty, but um, we could do the same thing with stock flow. Mm -hmm. We could do the same thing with dynamical systems. We could do the same thing with um, with a Petri net. We could do the same thing with representation of agents. Um, we could do the same thing with state charts and encoding of a state chart where we maybe collapse certain states into the same one or something like that. Um, the point is, this can be done with CSETs in general. As long as you have a single source category, same source category, that's why it's an a CSET transformation, you have this nice property that you can look for. And you may find cases of it. But do remember that it is possible you might have two structures where there is no mapping, right? You, you could have two where the, there's no mapping between them, yeah. um, where there's no possible mapping. Um, and we, saw, we we got a flavor of that or a whiff of it with that. Remember, three could only map into three because that was the only one which had the self edge. Yeah. If if that other graph didn't have a self edge, right? If it if it didn't have itself a self edge, that 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 other graph, if it if it hadn't been recommended by a self edge, we wouldn't have been able to map three into anything, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And say we can map the one to three, and then we can because of composition, one, two, three, two, and two, two, go to the three, so one can go to the three. Well, no, these are graphs though. Um, So there's one, no notion, they, sorry? No, this is the, uh, the and we kind of we can find the then uh, then uh, how can we map the... mean in here yeah. well but this graph doesn't guarantee transitivity this this is not a category yeah I mean this is only a yeah, graph that so that's same. Same. yeah yeah that's this same. is like a very specific graph like it's an example of a graph not a category yeah. so this is the so we can't collect how can I um, how can I map, for example, how can I find a map of one to three? Because one goes to three, so goes to three, so uh, I can map a one to three because they are connected. Um, this is a way that we can find. Well, oh, uh, but in general, there there's no guarantee for a graph structure that transitivity holds. So. And, and, it, and we're not dealing with a category. I, I think we'll have to discuss that more because I have a meeting in two minutes. So um, we're actually over time here. So, but I hope this is useful for getting you to think about homomorphism, these structure preserving mappings. And a key thing here is when we use these C sets as categorical encodings of, 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 of structures, we can reason about structure per, the relationships of these different things because category theory is all about relationships right mm -hmm. and recognizing these things are not one-offs they're not isolated fragmented solitudes they have relationships between but not everything is related you know to each other not not everything there may be two things that are incompatible but we we can recognize different ways in which they are related like by asking for all the homomorphisms between them and that's a very powerful thing to be able to speak of different models, not as well, like model A and model B, model C, they're all totally different, they have no relation. Instead, we're, we're getting to a more mature understanding, wait a minute, there are these families of models and relationships between models and ways in which they're related. 
And that's that's very powerful indeed. So we're going to be building on that notion in a in a homomorphisms are one of the most central things we'll be exploiting in this class, both, I might add, for stock flow in a central way, things like stratification, for example, um, uh, but also in the context of, um, of algebraic APIs, uh, you know, where we have homomorphisms being used to find patterns in the model state. But with those comments, I will close.